All right, for some, for the same reason that we whistle in the dark, we tend to trivialize anything or anyone that raises questions we don't want to answer or that confronts us with a picture of ourselves, which is unflattering and which we want to believe is inaccurate and untrue. Now, there's no better biblical illustration of this tendency than the ways in which we have reduced the monumental story about Noah and the flood to the likes of animal crackers, hilarious monologues such as Bill Cosby's classic, and delightful musicals such as Benjamin Britten's Noyes Fluta. Now, one does not have to accept the story as an objective account of an historical event in order to be deeply troubled by it. Whatever its proper literary genre, if the Bible is in fact the word of God, one might be forgiven the thought that God's purposes would have been better served had he used his red pencil liberally and crossed out chapters six through nine of Genesis. But God didn't do that. And since he didn't, you and I are left to wonder how things could have gotten so utterly out of control. Just four chapters earlier, God had stepped back and surveyed his creation and with considerable satisfaction pronounced it complete and good. Then in no time at all, he is on the verge of wasting everything he made and starting all over again. Earlier, we had a look at the sorry story told in those four intervening chapters. There came first the murder of Abel. Another son was born to replace him, <laughs> as Eve put it. But Seth, you remember, was one giant step removed from God's And from the offspring of Seth, there came Lamech, the progenitor of vengeance, revenge, and vigilante justice. Ultimately, the effect of human sinfulness, the inclination to breach the boundaries and seize the mysteries, was felt even in the halls of heaven as celestial functionaries consorted with human women. So powerful is this disfigured image that the entire scheme of creation is drawn into its orbit. Even the separation between the divine and human worlds has broken down, the orders of creation have been confused, and evil has become cosmic in its scope. All right then, things had gone entirely out of hand and some radical mid-course correction was necessary, but surely there was a better and fairer and more humane way of accomplishing that objective than through the horrible devastation of a flood. Just imagine the desperate struggle of men and women and children and animals to keep their heads above that relentlessly rising waters. And then for all of that, at the end of the story, we learn that the heart of humankind has not been changed by the experience, even a little bit, which only deepens the unsatisfying mystery of it all. Well, to probe the tale is to discover that the flood resulted not in a change of our attitude toward God, but rather in a change in the nature of God's relationship with us. For as the waters receded, 
and the rainbow appeared, retribution gave way to grace, and the course of history was set irrevocably for the incarnation. Now let me show you what that means. The Lord saw that the wickedness of humankind was great in the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of their hearts was only evil continually. We will never understand this story or hear what it tells us as long as we are cavalier in our attitude toward human sinfulness, the length and breadth and depth of it, the extent to which it pervades all that we do and think, and the degree to which human sinfulness is abhorrent to God and a fundamental contradiction of God's intentions for us. The writer was not providing us with a sociological commentary on those particular times, but rather he was making a theological statement about the nature of our relationship with God. We are ill served to suppose that in the days of Noah, for whatever reason, there must have been an unusually great amount of bribery and corruption, theft and murder, philandering and rape, more than the world has ever seen before or since. Now those are sins, sure enough, but even if we stand innocent of every one of them, we still have not escaped the indictment because behind all the sins you can name which you have not committed, there is still sin in the singular. That inclination, which none of us can escape, to cut ourselves off from God by living out of harmony with his intentions and expectations, that declaration of independence signed with our proxy by Adam and Eve, which lets it out that God is no longer the measure of what we do in our marriages, the rearing of our children, the conduct of our employment, or the attitude which shapes our personal relationships. It is so exceedingly easy for us to believe that sins are those things the law says you have to go to jail for. And since we all have clean records, we are surely not numbered among those this gloomy writer had in mind. But we are certainly quick enough to wonder where God is and what he's up to when the real, honest-to-goodness, world-class sinning is going on, aren't we? How can God allow such a thing? Writing of his experiences during the Second World War, the German theologian and preacher Helmut Thielicke said, I can still hear this question being put to me during the bombing, sometimes in great sadness and sometimes in rude sarcasm. A sea of flames raged over the city. People ran through the streets like living torches. Children suffocated in the cellars. Dresden perished in horror and in mortal terror. And as sure as death, always there came this one question. How can God permit such a thing? But, Telika went on, have we ever stopped to think that all these witches' Sabbaths were and are and will be again in the atomic disasters that may come, nothing but the consequences of man's playing hob with God's gift of freedom, that they are all misuses of a God-given power of attorney, squanderings of the Father's capital. When we wonder where God is, what he's doing, what he's up to, 
remember the consequences of man's playing hob with God's gift of freedom. Dorothy Sayers, whose keen theological insight was communicated through her splendid detection stories, challenged our self-serving notion that sin pertains only to such things as the Holocaust or the likes of the latest serial killer. This is what she wrote. Why does God allow the tyrants and great tormentors of humanity to exist? Why doesn't he strike them dead? Well, madam, why did he not strike you dumb before you uttered that baseless and unkind slander the day before yesterday? Or me, before I behaved with such cruel lack of consideration to that well-meaning friend? And why, sir, did he not cause your hand to rot off at the wrist before you signed your name to that dirty little bit of financial trickery? Your misdeeds and mine are nonetheless repellent because our opportunities for doing damage are less spectacular than those of other people. Do you suggest that your doing and mine are too trivial for God to bother about? That cuts both ways. For in that case, it would make precious little difference to his creation if he wiped us both out tomorrow. So, it is fundamental to any right understanding of both Judaism and Christianity that God created us for the purpose of entering into a loving relationship with us, but that in order for that relationship to have any mutuality, we must have the freedom to rebel, to ignore the conditions God has established, and to live life on our own terms. That attitude is pervasive, and its name is sin. So there is one thing we must understand about this story, and here's another one. We will never hear what is it is telling us, if our image of God is of one who is cold and remote and unfeeling and indifferent to the health of his creation. The word anthropomorphism means to attribute human characteristics to God. It is a greater tendency of Old Testament than of New Testament writers, and nowhere more so than in the story of Noah and the flood. Listen to these verbs. The Lord saw that the wickedness of humankind was great in the earth. It made him sorry that he had made humankind and it grieved him in his heart. God remembered Noah, who when he first set foot on dry ground, built an altar and placed upon it burnt offerings of gratitude, and the Lord smelled the pleasing odor and said in his heart, this writer is straining the limits of credibility and propriety to tell us that God is a person fully accessible to us who intends to be deeply involved with his creation who is capable of being angry and brokenhearted, and whose plans for us may be changed through our supplications and intercessions. Can you imagine a more disturbing statement than this from the pen of Karl Barth? God does not act in the same way whether we pray or not. The structure of that sentence is a little like throw mama from a train a kiss, but it's an incredible sentence. On the surface of it, that may sound like good news, but think about it. God does not act 
in the same way, whether we pray or not. If that is true, what freedom and opportunity we have, but on the other side of it, what a terrible burden of responsibility we bear. The events in our lives are not scripted out after all, are they? We complain under our breaths about the rigidity in Calvin's doctrine of predestination and the behavioral determinism, which some misunderstand it to mean. Yet there is also about it a certain abnegation of responsibility, isn't there, which some find comforting. Listen to Garrison Keeler. God created the world and ordained everything to be right and perfect. Then man sinned against God's will, but God still knew everything. Before the world was made, when it was only darkness and mist and waters, God was well aware of Lake Obagon, my family, our house, and he had me all sketched out down to what size my feet would be, big, which bike I would ride, a Schwinn, and the five ears of corn I'd eat for supper that night. He meant me to be there. It was his will, which it was up to me to discover the rest of and obey. But the first part, being me in Lake Wobegong, he had brought about as he had hung the stars and decided on blue for the sky. Well, if we and God are merely playing out a script that was dictated as he hung the stars and decided on blue for the sky, then tell me why our idolatry should come as any surprise to God or why his great heart should be broken by our rebellion. But the story of Noah and the flood brings us face to face with a God who takes with uncompromising seriousness his own purposes for creation and who is more than casually disturbed when those purposes are resisted with a daring that is breathtaking. This narrative invites us to penetrate into the very heart of God, where we find not an angry tyrant, but a deeply troubled parent grieving over the alienation of his children. By the sheer strength and force of the narrative, we are made to look upon the pathos of God, and that ought to be as painful to us as looking into the faces of our earthly parents or our dearest friends when we have betrayed them and show that we and know that we have broken their hearts. And so the rain began to fall. And in its refusal to stop, there comes the awful realization that because God is creator, God can indeed abandon that which he has made. Cosmos order was suspended and chaos was given permission to swagger unimpeded throughout the earth. But God remembered Noah. If the Lord can abandon what he has made, God can also rescue what he has condemned. In a word, God changed his mind. The Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of humankind, for the inclination of the human heart is evil from youth, nor will I ever again destroy every living creature as I have done. Note quickly, if regrettably, that despite an event of intervention than which there has never been 
anything is cataclysmic before or since. The condition of the human heart was precisely the same after the flood as it was before the first raindrops began to fall. It was not humanity, but God who said, never again, never again. The story of the flood does not concern strange meteorological phenomena, which happened in the history of the world, but rather strange and unaccountable changes, which happened in the heart of God. Now this daring assertion is problematic for anybody who wants God to be static and predictable and to stay safely in his place, who does not want God to act differently, whether we pray or not. Nevertheless, the story tells of a God who is decisively influenced by the hopeless inability of creation to be other than rebellious and idolatrous. And looking ahead, as you and I can do, we see that the world will be brought back to trust and obedience, not quickly by the fiat of a flood, but rather so very slowly, one stubborn heart at a time, through the pain and anguish of that creator God who never intended to remain above it all, but who knows now that he must enter fully into our alienation and suffer finally its most dreaded consequences. And there at last is the reason why there would have to come a day that we call Christmas. On the day God changed his mind, retribution gave way to grace as the basis for his relationship with us. And anyone who looked up that day would have surely seen there on the horizon of history, the outline of that ugly hill called Golgotha, the inevitable outcome of Christmas Day. The person of Noah ought to suggest as much, for Noah is a dim but clearly recognizable type of the one who is to come, a Christ-like figure, the bearer of an alternative possibility, righteous when there was every reason not to be, obedient to an absurd command, faithful during unimaginable adversity, quick to give God the glory once the ordeal had passed, and blessed, therefore, with the high privilege of beginning creation brand new. That creation itself was reordered on the day that retribution gave way to grace. As long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. Whether we will ever again be faithful to God in the unfailing repetition of the seasons, we have God's promise that he will never abandon us, that God will undergird with his providence the rebellious as well as the obedient, and that lest God forget, as a reminder to himself, I have set my bow in the clouds, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature, and the waters shall never again 
become a flood to destroy all flesh. Are you aware that we live out our lives bracketed by rainbows? The rainbow of grace given by God on the day he changed his mind and the rainbow of triumph toward which God is moving the whole of history. Do you remember this from John's vision of what awaits us at the end of time? At once I was in the spirit, he said, and there in heaven stood a throne with one seated on the throne. And the one seated there looks like Jasper and Carnelian. And around the throne, there is a rainbow that looks like an emerald. And beneath that emerald arc, there gathered a choir, which sang, Holy, 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 the Lord God, the Almighty, who was and is and is to come. You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. The promise is that we too will see that rainbow and sing in that choir, but only because there was a day when God changed his mind and the empty tomb is the proof of it. We are bracketed by rainbows. And remember that the next time you see one. And there you have it. The rainbow is God's reminder to himself of the day when he changed his mind. What do you think? Thank you very much. Um, if anybody has any questions, uh, you can unmute yourself and ask them. Or comments or whatever. love rainbows and when you say the beginning to end I say coast to coast from Oregon the most beautiful rainbows and now to Pennsylvania in our backyard off the deck gorgeous rainbows I call my neighbors to let them know the beauty in the sky not to be missed so well, I hope your message has brought that even more to the forefront I hope you'll tell them when you call them what the rainbow means. Now I will. <laughs> yes. maybe, the la maybe the last time you get together, but at least. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> yeah. Bracketed by rainbows. Somebody else. I want to. Uh, finish up with a couple of words about the word covenant, uh, which God indicated the rainbow was a sign of his covenant with the earth. You remember, some of you will remember that I told you last week that the imago dei, the image of God, was one of those concepts critically important for Christians to understand because it explains the necessity of the incarnation and the results of the incarnation. And it ties the Old Testament and the New Testament together. But another of these very important concepts for us to understand is the word covenant, for it also ties the two testaments together. And it is central to an understanding of the Eucharist. 
The etymology of the word covenant is unclear, but the best guess is that it derives from an Assyrio-Babylonian word meaning to bind or to fetter. Hence, two parties bound together by an oath. Now, the first evidence of the covenant is the rainbow. God said to Noah, as for me, I am establishing my covenant with you and your descendants after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the domestic animals, and every animal of the earth with you, as many as came out of the earth, that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of a flood. This is the sign of the covenant. I have set my bow in the clouds, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. So the first evidence of the covenant is between God and the whole of creation. The covenant becomes more specific in a very strange event between God and Abraham. And we'll talk more about that in a couple of weeks. An account of this event is not for the squeamish. As they say on TV, be warned that some may find this video disturbing. God said to Abraham, you can read about this in the 15th chapter of Genesis. God said to Abraham, bring me a heifer three years old, a female goat three years old, a ram three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. Abraham brought them and then cut each one in half, except for the birds, which he did not cut in two. Then a deep sleep came over Abraham, and when it was dark, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. On that day, now stay alert, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying to your descendants, I give this land. So from the rainbow to that smelly mess between Abraham and God is the covenant being developed the people's obligation to the covenant relationship was specifically defined at Sinai when God gave Moses the Ten Commandments. Adhering to the law became the basis of the relationship between God and Israel until a fascinating hint at something more, something radically new came in this tantalizing revelation to Jeremiah. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors, which they broke. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Now that promise came true when on the night Jesus was betrayed, he took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So watch how we come full circle. From the rainbow 
in the experience of Noah to the covenant with Abraham to its explicit covenant relationship at Sinai to the whisper of something new from the pen of Jeremiah to the upper room and then in heaven a rainbow that looks like an emerald and there you have it everything I know to tell you about rainbows thank you so much it was just wonderful I appreciate that and again I repeat that if anybody ever has anything to say or questions to ask you have my email probably have my phone number and by all means let me hear from you otherwise next week comes the Tower of Babel and that will finish the first major section of Genesis Genesis 1 through 11 contains a certain type of literature which changes in the first verse of 12. We go from what some call myth, which is simply a type of literature, to what is called legend, with the beginning of the Abraham story in chapter 12. Called legend rather than history, simply because there exists no extra canonical account of the stories in the remainder of Genesis. Everything we know about Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph, we know from the book of Genesis. So that's referred to as legend, the first 11 chapters about the beginnings uh, of creation and the sorting out of creation come in the first 11 chapters. So once we deal with the Tower of Babel, then we will settle in for some wonderful stories, beginning with Abraham and Isaac, whose name means laughter, which is exactly what Sarah did when somebody told her she would get pregnant at the age of 90. All right. Anything else? All right. I'm going to leave. Good to be Thank with you. you. Thank you, Jen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.